स्थापकाय च धर्म से सर्वधर्मस्वी अवतारवरिष्ठा रामकृष्णा ते नम गुड एवरी वन वेलकम टू अ न्यू क्लास इट्स पतंजलिज योग सूत्रस इट्स आर फर्स्ट क्लास ऑन द योग सूत्रस what i assign for you guys from our main textbook which is edwin bryant's the yoga sutras of patanjali um i assign to you pages 31 to 67 of edwin bryant's introduction so they're in roman numerals which some of you might be shaky on so it's about 35 pages of reading parts of it somewhat dense admittedly uh hi and so the first question is how many you actually how many of you actually did the reading okay well done we got one person most of you are just coming for the first time and so i forgive you <laughs> okay we got one person at least who did the reading that's good and ella should be coming soon he always does the reading okay so what i'll what i'll do is maybe toward the end of the class I'll ask whether you have questions any questions about the reading but I want to cover quite a few topics based on the reading we did for today but I also want to just give a heads up our next assignment I'm not even sure what the date of our next class is because our April schedule has not yet been decided but once it's determined we'll know um but I'm going to just announce the next assignment anyway it'll be sometime in April hopefully Uh please read pages 3 through 21 of Edwin Bryant's book Yoga Sutras of Patanjali which is his commentary on the first two sutras of book 1 of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras You understand So his commentary on the first two sutras of the Yoga Sutra is the assignment for next time There's somewhat lengthy commentaries because it's the beginning of the text and so he has a lot to say. And and in it, that's the mandatory assignment. You might ask, well, what does that mean? If I don't do it, what will happen? Nothing will happen, but I'm just I'm stipulating that it's mandatory. Yeah. <laughs> just so that you have a little something to inspire you to do something. Okay. At the same time, there's an optional part of the assignment as well. What are the optional parts? There are two optional parts. First optional part is you can also read if you're interested whole or some parts of Vyasa's commentary on the Yoga Sutras. Vyasa wrote the first and most important commentary Bhashya on the Yoga Sutras. And whenever you see a copy of the Yoga Sutras at least the traditional Sanskrit copy of the Yoga Sutras it'll always be accompanied by Vyasa's commentary if no other commentary is there Vyasa will always be there as if they're sort of inseparable you can't under, really understand the sutras without reading Vyasa's commentary along with it this book draws copiously on Vyasa's commentaries but he doesn't give the whole commentary of Vyasa so what you could do is just there are hundreds of books with Vyasa's commentary i'm giving you one example uh this is the yoga philosophy of patanjali by sankhya yogacharya swami hari hararanda aranya who is a great modern sankhya yogi monk who founded if anyone's interested or knows the kapil math in jharkhand madhupur which i visited twice and uh they lead very austere lives there's one monk who lives in a in an artificial cave and he only speaks to devotees through a window uh a couple times a year and he's never allowed to leave that cave for the rest of his life and he leaves his body in that cave uh anyway it's very interesting it's worth checking out okay so this book has vyasa's commentary in the original sanskrit and in english translation and there are many other books like that so that's optional reading vyasa's commentary if you're ever interested and also another optional assignment is you can look at swami vekananda's commentary on the same sutras that we're studying together 
from Raja Yoga, because he has given his own translation and commentary on the entire Yoga Sutras at the end of his book, Raja Yoga, which we were studying before in the past few months. And then there's a third optional assignment for those of you who are feeling brave. Uh, you can memorize the sutras as we study them. This is the traditional method in India. Um, I joined as a brahmacharya in, in 2010 at Vivekananda University in Bilumat. And I attended classes on Yoga Sutras, Bhagavad Gita, Upanishads. And they're all in the Sanskrit department. They're all taught in Sanskrit. The teacher is speaking in Sanskrit. The students are responding in Sanskrit. So it's pretty intense. And so I attended this class on Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. And their method was, at the very beginning of class, after the mantra, chanting the mantra, they chant together from memory all the sutras up to the one that they are going to discuss in that class. You see what I mean? So if in our, in our next class, we're going to be discussing the first two sutras. So we would say, at the very beginning of class, Atha yoga anushasanam, yoga shchitta vritti rodaha, and then class will start. So I'm going to attempt that pedagogical method. I don't want to intimidate you guys, but I think it's a nice way to, for those who are interested in memorizing, at the very beginning of class, you can try to recite from memory the sutras. And for those of you who uh, don't want to memorize, you can just chant along with me by reading from the text. OK? All right. So that was kind of a lot. But So next assignment for next month, presumably next month, but we don't know the date. Read Edwin Bryan's commentary on the first two sutras of the Yoga Sutra, pages 3 through 21 of the book. And then if you want, you can also try to memorize sutras 1 and 2. It's not that hard. The whole Sutras are designed to be memorized, actually, to facilitate memorization. That's the way that they're crafted. Uh, so you'll find that even if you try and you have a decent memory, it'll be relatively easy to memorize them. OK, now let's get into today's discussion and reading, pages 31 to 67 of Edwin Bryan's introduction to his entire book. One thing that's really unique and I think really impressive and important about Bryant's book and his overall approach is that he is a scholar. He's an academic scholar of Indian philosophy. But he's also a spiritual practitioner. He's a sadhaka. And it's rare to find that combination. But I think it's essential. And I try to uh, adopt that approach in my own work, in my own academic work. Uh, why is that so important? Why am I placing such an emphasis on that? Well, because if you're just a scholar, often you neglect the spiritual dimension of scriptures like Yoga Sutra, Bhagavad Gita, and it can become dry, overly pedantic, losing sight of why, why these texts matter to us in the first place. On the other hand, if you're just a pure spiritual practitioner, completely unacademic and unscholarly, I think the great danger on that side is lack of rigor and lack of depth. And uh, just to use a somewhat pejorative and casual term, a bit too foofy. So I want to avoid foofiness on the one hand, the foofiness of a purely sadhana-oriented approach that poo-poo's scholarship and says that that's, all, that's just for academics. That's dry stuff. That's, I, I just want to focus on spiritual practice. And on the other hand, to avoid the danger of academic pedantry and dryness and the neglect of the spiritual which is the main reason why we're all here, because we're spiritual aspirants. So that should not be lost sight of. But the ideal is to combine both. Combine the rigor of the scholarly approach with the spiritual emphasis of the traditional sadhana-oriented approach. And I think Bryant does that very well. I'm sure there are others. But this is a very impressive achievement. It doesn't mean I agree with everything, everything he says. You're going to find that even today, a little later in our discussion. Um, I'll register one of my disagreements with uh, Brian's interpretation. But it's a very thought-provoking book and very well-researched. So I assigned 35 pages. There's a lot there. I'm not going to cover everything. And we're not going to read through the whole thing, obviously. I'm just going to highlight a few of the things that he points out and some of the issues he raises. And I want to focus on some problems that he discusses, because I think some of them are extremely important and interesting. 
the most fundamental of which I think, I'll get to it in a second, but who exactly is bound and who is liberated? You might think this is a very, there must be a simple answer to this. There's not at all a simple answer to this. It's, I think it's a really, really tricky question within the framework of Sankhya and yoga philosophy. But anyway, we'll get to that in a bit. First of all, what is the date of the Yoga Sutras? When was it actually composed? We don't know. Um, he talks about this in the introduction. He's very uh, cautious, and so he doesn't give any specific dates. And he says, all we can say with certainty is that it was composed no later than the 5th century CE of the Common Era. Um, usually, I find that scholars tend to date the text between 100 and 200 CE. Uh, traditionalists tend to push back the date further back into the before the Common Era, BCE. That's kind of common, especially in India. Um, but I think one of the things that makes it clear, I think, that or it makes it very probable that Yoga Sutra was composed in the Common Era is that the influence of Buddhism seems to be fairly strong. There are certain terms used in the Yoga Sutra which you find in Buddhist scriptures, which obviously were in the, before the Common Era. There are a lot of similarities. Um, so that's one of the many reasons why um, scholars tend to date the Yoga Sutra post-Buddhism, after Buddhism, and in the first few centuries of the Common Era. Okay. Another thing, what exactly does sutra mean? It's called yoga sutras. There are many sutra texts. One of the most famous in Vedanta is called Brahma Sutra, otherwise known as Vedanta Sutra, which is, can be confusing. It's the same text, actually. He uses the term Vedanta Sutra here. That's exactly the same thing as Brahma Sutra, so they're just synonyms. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Sutra means thread. The idea being, it's an extremely compressed statement that contains all the essential information, provided you have a competent guru or teacher to guide you and to explain to you the deep meaning of that sutra. So that provided, that qualification is important because, as Brian points out, some of these sutras are unintelligible on their own. Some, not all. Some of them are actually grammatically complete sentences. You can more or less make sense of them. But others are not. And so you need the help of commentaries or a living guru or teacher that can guide you through it. But the basic idea is that it contains all the essential information. It's very easy to memorize. And so it's very, and remember, these are all oral traditions. Before things were written, they were passed down orally. And so the sutra form made it very easy to teach the sutras to your disciples, your students, and then they would pass it on to their students and so on and so forth. And the moment I, I repeat Atta Yoga Anushasanam, then the main ideas come to my mind, taught to me by my teacher, and then I can teach them to my students like that. that was, that's the basic idea. So that's the sutra form. I'll say one thing. Um, we're fortunate, actually, in the Yoga Sutras that the sutras are generally grammatically complete sentences. Because if you look at the Brahma Sutras, my goodness, your head will start spinning. There, literally, there's a sutra which is just cha, <laughs> which means and. <laughs> You, how, what, what, is, what do you do with that? So, you, you, you real, I mean, so with the Brahma Sutras, you, you, a, you absolutely re require commentaries on every single sutra, more or less. With the Yoga Sutras, what scholars have tried to do, actually, is to try to understand the meaning of the sutras independently of the commentaries. And that's not a completely far-fetched project within the context of the Yoga Sutras because so many of the sutras are intelligible on their own. It's almost impossible in the case of Brahma Sutra. I've attempted it in one article, if you're interested. Asman Nasya Cha Tad Yogam Shasti, Swami Vivekananda's interpretation of Brahma Sutra 1.1.19, .1 something like that. Uh, but it's very difficult because the sutras are so cryptic and compressed. So, Brian. Let me read you again the subtitle of his book. So the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali is the main title. The subtitle is A New Edition, Translation, and Commentary with Insights from the Traditional Commentators. And he could also have added and modern scholars because he includes both. And I think that's part of what makes the book so valuable. 
he's very respectful, if not reverential, toward traditional commentators, starting with Vyasa. And we'll talk about some of the other traditional commentators that he draws upon. But he's also aware, because he's a scholar, he's aware of contemporary scholarship on the Yoga Sutras. And he draws on insights and ideas from modern scholarship as well. And so it is a very unique text, because I haven't encountered any other text quite like it. As I said, that doesn't mean I agree with everything he says. You should feel free to disagree. And in fact, a good scholar will be happy if other people disagree with them. Otherwise, scholarship gets boring. So you need somebody to disagree with. Um, so to understand what the sutras are saying, it often helps to kind of triangulate and compare different commentaries. So instead of relying on any one commentary, which is, I think, something that some people do, many people do. They read one commentary, take that to be the gospel truth, and just follow that throughout. I think that's um, a mistake uh, in general. I mean, there, it depends on what your needs are and what your aim is. But uh, if, you're, if your main aim is to understand what Patanjali means or meant in a particular sutra, I think it, it's, it's always better to expose yourself, just be acquainted with different interpretations of the same sutra, and then judge for yourself. OK, now, there's a, a, a few pages in the introduction in the assignment for today where he talks about the six schools of Indian philosophy, which we've talked about a lot. So I'm not going to uh, belabor that. Uh, but what are those six schools? Sankhya, yoga. What are the remaining four? Yeah, Vedanta, but what's the sister to Vedanta? Yeah, yeah, Purva Mimamsa and Vedanta, otherwise known as Uttara Mimamsa, and then Nyaya and Vaisheshika. These are the six schools. And Patanjali's yoga philosophy was not considered a separate school, one of these six schools, until centuries after it was composed. The first reference to Patanjali's yoga as a distinct school is in, interestingly, Shankara's commentaries. 8th century, roughly 8th century CE. Um, and, and yoga, the, the concept, the practice, the discipline, was around for many, many centuries, even before Patanjali. So Patanjali was not the founder of yoga. That's an important thing to keep in mind. He emphasizes that as well. Brian does. He codified and systematized the different teachings and practices of yoga at the time. And his text became fundamental and kind of the seminal textbook for yoga philosophy later. It became the canonical scripture for yoga philosophy. I want to mention a couple scholarly issues that he raises. Like one of them is some scholars, like Paul Doysen, the, the German scholar that Swami Vivekananda had met, Shurendranath Dasgupta, and some others, they consider Yoga Sutras to be a composite text, which means what they find is when they read the sutras, they find that it sort of jumps that it's talking about one theme, and then suddenly the next sutra is talking about something totally different. They say, wait a minute, then this is probably not one unified text. It seems like it's like two texts at least patched together, maybe at different times. So this is one scholarly theory. Um, where does Bryant stand on the issue? He, uh, tends, he thinks that it's more plausible to read the, the entire Yoga Sutra as one unified text, not as a composite text, not as a hodgepodge of different texts. But even he admits that there are places where the text uh, is a little strange and difficult to interpret. And there seems to be a certain overlap in concepts, which is uh, at, at least raises questions. So I want to give you one example. This is one that will strike any attentive reader of the Yoga Sutras. We'll get to it eventually. It's in book two. The very first sutra of book two defines Kriya Yoga. Kriya Yoga, which has become popular for other reasons because of Paramahamsa Yogananda, which is a uh, somewhat different kind of Kriya Yoga. But anyways, Patanjali defines Kriya Yoga based on three terms, Tapaha, Swadhyaya, Ishvara, Pranidhanani. Austerity, Tapaha means austerity. Swadhyaya means study, study of scriptures mainly. And Ishvara, Ishvara Pranidhana means surrender to God, right? What's interesting is that in that same book, but in sutras 28 to 29, Patanjali talks about a different set of practices, which he calls Ashtanga Yoga, the very famous Ashtanga Yoga, the eight-limbed yoga. 
There, the second limb is niyama. And niyama contains all the three items contained in Kriya Yoga, plus two more, shaucha and santosha. Shaucha means purity, and santosha means contentment. And so then there's this question of how does Kriya Yoga mentioned in Sutra 2.1 relate to the Ashtanga Yoga in 2.28 to 29? How do these different, these, the, the exact same three terms are used in both contexts, but how exactly they relate to each other is confusing. And it's not explained by Patanjali very clearly. And so it's possible that, uh, it's, that the Kriya Yoga was one tradition of yoga and that Ashtanga Yoga is another one. And Brian's view is that doesn't mean it's a composite text. He sees Patanjali as drawing together, synthesizing different extant yoga traditions at, at the time. So there was a kind of Kriya Yoga grounded yoga tradition in his time, Patanjali's time. There's also an Ashtanga Yoga based yoga tradition and he fused them together in his own text, the Yoga Sutras. That's his view. Um, which I find uh, fairly plausible. It's very difficult to decide for sure what's, what's the right one. I'm just flagging for you different possible ways of approaching this text. One is as a strictly unified whole, and where every sutra follows seamlessly from the previous one in a very logical progression. Uh, another view at the other extreme is this Dois and Dasgupta kind of view, which is that actually it's several texts spliced together. It's a kind of hybrid text, composite text. But the middle ground here is Brian's. He concedes that at certain places, it's, it's not always easy to follow the logic of the sutras. At the same time, there's no need to jump to the conclusion that it's a composite text, that there are multiple authors. It could still be Patanjali himself consciously synthesizing different traditions during his time. Now, I want to mention one thing about Vyasa here. I keep saying Vyasa. Vyasa is considered to be, that's the name given to that first commentator on the Yoga Sutras, the one that's most fundamental, most important, foundational for all subsequent commentaries. There isn't a single commentator on the Yoga Sutra who rejects Vyasa. Everybody accepts Vyasa. Even Swami Vivekananda, even though I don't think he refers to Vyasa by name, he's read Vyasa's commentary thoroughly, and he presupposes it in his own commentaries on the different sutras. So keep that in mind. But there's a, a, a tricky scholarly issue here, too. Philip Moss, a European scholar, in 2013, he published an article called A Concise Historiography of Classical Yoga Philosophy, where he makes a very provocative argument. He says, I think that Vyasa is not the author of that commentary. I think it's Patanjali himself. <laughs> Patanjali composed both the sutras and that commentary which is traditionally attributed to Vyasa. And his evidence is very interesting. I'm not saying it's conclusive, but it's very interesting. And one of the pieces of evidence is mentioned by Bryant as well. Even though Bryant's book was published in 2009, which is three, four years before Moss's article was published, so Bryant doesn't refer to Moss's article. But I want to point to, for instance, page 38, Roman numeral 38. Bryant says, uh, hmm. oh yeah, we will see, he says at the bottom of this XXXVIII, for those of you who have trouble with Roman numerals, 38, he says, we will see at the bottom of the page, we will see that some commentators, both traditional and modern, even hold Vyasa's commentary to be that of Patanjali himself. Way back, it's not that Moss is the first to come up with this idea. A number of traditional commentators also referred to Vyasa's commentar commentary as authored by Patanjali himself. And there are many other uh, pieces of evidence as well. I'm not going to, uh, if you're interested, read his article. It's called A Concise Historiography of Classical Yoga Philosophy. Um, I'm just going to stick to Vyasa, not because I'm sure that it was Vyasa, but um, just because it's easier. But be aware of that issue as well. OK, which commentators does Bryant draw upon and refer to in his commentary? Starts with Vyasa or pseudo Vyasa. Uh, second, Shankara's Vivarana. Now, who is this Shankara? Traditionally, this is the same Shankara as the uh, great champion of classical Advaita Vedanta, 
But that's also uncertain. It's doubtful. So I'll refer to it as pseudo Shankara's Vivarana. Uh, Vachaspati Mishra's Tattva Vaisharadi. That's another important commentary written on the Yoga Sutras. Vachaspati Mishra. He's also, he was also, he wrote a brilliant commentary on Advaita Vedanta. And then I'll just mention the names of some of the other ones. Bhojaraja, Vigyana Bhikshu, Ramananda Saraswati. And these are all kind of many centuries ago. There's one commentator from the 20th century that he refers to, Hari Harananda Aranya, that same book that I mentioned. He was a brilliant Bengali scholarly monk and yogi in the Sankhya Yoga tradition, born in 1869, left his body in 1947. He wrote, he was a great Sanskrit scholar. He wrote a, a number of works in Sanskrit and Bengali, and some in English. And he wrote a, a masterful and voluminous commentary on the Yoga Sutra in Bangla called Patanjal Jogdarshan, which has been translated more or less in full, but not fully, in, in the form of this book, Yoga Philosophy of Patanjali by Sankhya Yogacharya Swami Harihara Aranya. Now, uh, Edwin Bryant, I don't know if he knows Bengali or not. I don't think he does, um, because he doesn't mention this book, which I take to be Hariharana's magnum opus. It's the most detailed and deep commentary on the Yoga Sutra. The thing is, the same Hariharana Aranya wrote a Sanskrit commentary on the Yoga Sutra as well, called Bhaswati, and it's much shorter than this. Edwin Bryant refers to that one, the Bhaswati, the shorter, much shorter Sanskrit commentary, and doesn't even mention the original Bengali one. I actually really like the Bengali one. Um, and I've written an article, if you're interested, on a single word of the Yoga Sutra, of, uh, like a very scholarly kind of analysis of the word smriti in 1.19, uh, 1.11 or 1.19 of Yoga Sutra. It's called yogic mindfulness. So if you're interested, you can look that up and download it. Uh, but that's based on this fat Bengali book, mainly. OK, so what we'll do from now on when we discuss the sutras is we'll look primarily at Bryant's commentary, but also, from time to time, look at Swami Vivekananda's commentary and sometimes Hariharana Aranya's commentary, Vyasa's commentary sometimes. OK, now I want to get into some of the interesting issues raised by Bryant in the, the densest section of the assignment for today, which is the subject matter of the Yoga Sutras, right, that section. He talks at length about how Patanjali's yoga philosophy is based on Sankhya metaphysics, the Sankhya system. And Sankhya's metaphysics is dualistic. It's a metaphysical dualism. What are the two fundamental entities? Purusha and Prakriti. Purusha means eternal conscious soul or self, pure consciousness. What's important, there are a couple things to keep in mind about Purusha here. Number one is there are multiple Purushas. Each one of us has a different Purusha corresponding to each of our physical bodies and minds. Okay? There's no non-dual Purusha here in, in the Yoga Sutra. That we, shouldn't, we should be careful not to read Vedanta into Patanjali's text. Multiple Purushas. Secondly, what is the nature of these Purushas? As I said, eternal conscious selves or souls, you can call them pure consciousness, they're strictly inactive. They are non-doers. They are never entangled in this world. They are ever free, ever perfect, perfectly liberated. They were never bound. We'll, find, we'll see this coming up later explicitly. On the other hand, so there are multiple purushas on the one hand, eternal conscious souls, which is our true nature. And we suffer because we mistakenly think that we are these body-mind complexes rather than our deeper spiritual nature as purusha. On the other hand, there's what's called prakriti, roughly translated as nature. All of prakriti is, strictly speaking, insentient, completely lacking in consciousness. Okay, So there are conscious purushas on the one hand, and there's insentient nature on the other, prakriti on the other. What falls under prakriti? physical bodies, those pews, this table, microphone, all that. But even more interestingly, our minds fall on the side of Prakriti, not on the side of Purusha. And this is extremely strange to many Western ears. 
who think that the mind is conscious, obviously. The body is not conscious, but the mind is conscious. Descartes is one of the most important Western philosophers to teach this kind of dualism, mind-body dualism. The mind is conscious, and the mind is equated with the soul, essentially. And so the mind slash soul on one side, and the physical body on the other, that's Cartesian dualism. That's the dualism made famous by Descartes, and which is uh, still the most famous, most prominent form of dualism out there, in the West at least. And in India, both mind and body fall on the side of, side of nature. And on the other side of the duality, you get the conscious purusha, the conscious soul. So there's, there's a split between mind and soul in Indian traditions. That's very, very important. One really uh, nice insight of Brian's here, this is on page XLVI, which means 46. After talking about what I just talked about, he says, as an aside, so this is about roughly one third of the page down. As an aside, in this regard, yoga has a curious overlap with modern reductive materialism, which holds that the internal world of thought and feeling is ultimately reducible to neurological brain functioning and other purely material phenomena, as well as with the computational procedures of artificial intelligence. It thereby offers an unexpected overlap with modern functionalist accounts of mind that merits further exploration. And then he adds, in parentheses, avoiding some of the pitfalls in the Cartesian view in this regard, while simultaneously, unlike artificial intelligence, retaining consciousness itself as independent of cognition. This is very, uh, I mean, this is a little bit scholarly and might be hard to follow, but the, the basic idea is really important, I think. He's saying one really modern uh, in very contemporary sounding aspect of Sankhya and yoga philosophy is that mind can be explained in strictly neurological scientific terms, in materialistic terms, because it falls on the side of nature. It's, it's, it belongs to insentient na nature. It's also just insentient matter, just in a more subtle form. It's subtle insentient matter. And so neuroscientists who, are, who don't believe in anything spiritual, no God, forget about even about God, they believe that consciousness itself is a product of the brain. They'll be very happy with the Sankhya explanation of thoughts and feelings be uh, as part of nature, just as basically brain states. At the same time, there's an important difference, a crucial difference between Sankhya and yoga on the one hand and modern neuroscience on the other. What is that? Sankhya and yoga deny the fundamental neuroscientific materialist assumption that consciousness is a product of the brain. Consciousness is on the side of Purusha. It belongs neither to body nor to mind. It's just separate. And neuroscientists will be very skeptical and say, well, why should we believe that? That just sounds like a religious dogma. Sankhya yogis, that's part of the reason why we spend so many classes on Raja Yoga, the, Swami Vivekananda's preface and introduction. Because Patanjali says, here's a scientific technique for directly realizing that you are, in fact, the conscious purusha, separate from the body-mind complex. Here's the technique, the eight-limbed yoga, the kriya yoga. If you practice this, you yourself will be able to experientially verify the truth that consciousness resides in the purusha and, and not in the body or in the mind, and that your true nature is to be an eternal conscious soul. OK? All right, so now we get to that problem that I promised I would discuss, which I find very interesting. And I think it's very, very important for understanding Sankhya and yoga philosophy. Here's the problem. Uh, the whole purpose of this scripture, the Yoga Sutra, is what? Well, we're not fully content, right? We're suffering. We find ourselves suffering. And we want to be liberated from suffering. All of spiritual life is about that, right? But then there's an obvious question. Who is the one suffering? Who is the one who seeks liberation? Who is the one who's reading the Yoga Sutra now trying to get liberation? Who is bound and liberated? Let's look at Brian's answer to the question, and then I want to ask you guys what you think, and then we'll take it from there. XLVI, same page that we were already on. Let's look at the next paragraph. OK. And the uh, second sentence of that paragraph, we'll start there. OK. Animated by consciousness, it is the mind that imagines itself to be the real self. 
rather than a material entity external to consciousness. Let me just pause there. There's, it's getting kind of technical. See, Purusha alone is conscious, right? And on the other side, you have nature. You have mind, which is insentient. Why is it that we think that the mind is conscious? When we have a thought, we think that it's a conscious thought, that I'm thinking. I'm consciously raising a thought. None of that's true, actually. It's because Purusha, the consciousness of Purusha, is kind of illuminating this insentient mind and makes it seem as if the mind is sentient and conscious, but in fact, it's not. That's the background behind what he's saying. Animated by consciousness, meaning the consciousness of Purusha, it is the mind on the side of Prakriti that imagines itself to be the real self rather than a material entity external to consciousness. The mind doesn't realize that it belongs to nature. It thinks that it's conscious. Okay, so he's already, I hope you already get the drift of his answer to the question of who is bound and liberated. He, it'll become very explicit soon in the same paragraph, but he says very clearly, it's the mind that thinks it's bound and liberated. So, okay, let me keep going. The mind, they, so look at the next sentence. The mind is therefore the seat of ignorance and bondage. Purusha is, quote, and he's quoting directly from one of the foundational texts of Sankhya, Sankhya Karika, 19. Wit, the Purusha is witness, free, indifferent, a spectator, and inactive. And then he says, Brian says, therefore, while the goal of the entire yoga system and of Indic soteriological, meaning liberation-seeking thought in general, is to extricate pure consciousness from its embroilment with the internal workings of the mind, as well as the external senses of the body. In fact, according to Sankhya, quote, and he's quoting again from that same Sankhya Karika, but this is 62, no one is actually either bound or liberated. This is a direct quotation from Sankhya Karika. No one is actually either bound or liberated, nor does anyone transmigrate. It is only Prakriti in her various manifestations who is bound, transmigrates, and released." End quote. This is very interesting. So then Brian says, Purusha is eternal and therefore not subject to changes such as bondage and liberation. In the yoga tradition, the quest for liberation, in other words, in other words, human agency, is a function of the prakritic mind, not of purusha. The prakritic mind, that's Brian's answer to the question of who is bound and liberated. It's a mind, he says. He also adds in the next sentence, and I'll just mention it. We will revisit the implications of this fundamental principle and since it is perceived by its detractors as the Achilles heel of an otherwise meritorious system, the reactions to it from other Indic schools of thought in our concluding reflections. He's alluding very briefly to, I think too briefly, to the fact that there are a number of other philosophical traditions, scholars, both traditional and modern, who find this aspect of Sankhya to be extremely problematic. They think that Sankhya and yoga can't provide a cogent answer to the question of exactly who is bound and liberated. That's why he's referring to it as the Achilles heel of the Sankhya yoga system. Why? Why? What's the problem? So let me ask you. Or are you perfectly satisfied with Brian's answer? Everything's, everything is hunky-dory? Prakritic mind is who is the, that entity which is bound and liberated. Anything wrong with that? Or is everyone on board with Bryant? Any thoughts? Yeah. Can you hand the mic to her, please? She loves the mic. Well, to me, oh my god. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, when I, I mean, I don't know much Sankhya besides mm -hmm. the thing that I mm -hmm. read. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing that kind of makes no logical sense in mm -hmm. my head is the like then like what is exactly prakriti and why does it have like almost like existence e even if it's kind of like a weird relative existence in a sense because mm. it is only illumined by the mm. Purusha that, and that's how we well, perceive let's be careful. it. One, one thing, let's just to clarify, do you mean existence or consciousness? They're not the same thing. Yeah. Something yeah. can exist but not be conscious. Yeah, I meant as existence. It. You mean existence? Yeah. Not consciousness? Yeah. You're saying that Sankhya says that none of this exists? I'm not saying oh. that Sankhya says it doesn't oh, exist. So I just mean, like, what's confusing to me is, mm -hmm. like, then what exactly is Prakriti? Like, where does Prakriti come from then? Like, because it's like, uh, mm -hmm. like, there's the 
eternal Purusha and then this yeah. weird thing oh, called I see. Okay. Prakriti, you know, it's like, okay. and it's like, okay. Where does and, it come uh, from? I see. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is a kind of, a, this is another important question yeah. raised by the, the opponents, like opposing schools of Sankhya and Yoga, like Vedanta. They say, it's just like, are you saying it's a brute fact that there's Prakriti just lying out there? Yeah. But I don't think it's the same question as the one that we're talking about now. Unless you can make a case for it, but well, just can you give it back to her? <laughs> I mean, I just mean like because you're asking, you know, in the sense like, okay, who's bound, who's liberated? Mm -hmm. But they're saying like, okay, like <laughs> the mind, which is prakriti. But you know, it, to me, like, well, what is prakriti? Is exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that, okay, that's one way. It's a kind of indirect uh, route at uh, pointing out a problem in, to the question. Um, yeah, and we'll get to that when we get to the twenty-four cosmic principles and that very elaborate chart that comes in the, later in the in the reading. Uh, okay, but just sticking to the philosophical principles of Purusha and Prakriti, what might be the problem with, can you bring the mic over to Katyayani? What might be the problem with thinking of the mind as that entity which is bound and liberated? Yeah. Well, my question is that when I would consider if someone is free or not, it would be if they identify with the mind or body. But isn't identification part of the mind anyway? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. I think I, I think it's genuinely confusing this issue. Um, let me let me put it in this way, okay? On the one hand, I think Brian's right in saying that Purusha can't be the one who's bound and liberated. Why? Because Purusha is ever free, it's never bound. And the foundational texts of Sankhya say that very clearly. No one is bound or liberated, nor does anyone transmigrate. The Purusha is never bound, it's eternally free. It has nothing to do with Prakriti. Can't be Purusha. What does that leave us with? Well, the only other option seems to be Prakriti, some aspect of Prakriti. Prakriti we find is, there's the, the kind of causal matrix of nature, the, like the original form of Prakriti, which then evolves into all of the different evolutes of Prakriti. One of which is buddhi, meaning the intellect. Another one is mind, manas, and, and ahankara, the eye sense, and all these other things. And so Brian identifies, he singles out the mind as that aspect of nature which is bound and liberated. The problem is, I think, not just me, but there are many scholars who think this, Mind is insentient, right? How in the world can something that's strictly insentient think of itself as bound? The feeling of bondage and suffering requires consciousness. Let me repeat that. The feeling of being bound, the feeling that I suffer, I don't like this anymore, requires consciousness. And yet the mind is insentient, so that can't be the thing that's suffering. And the only option left is purusha, which can't be suffering because it's completely separate from prakriti, and it's pure consciousness, and it's inactive. And where does that leave us? It's very, very tricky. And so over the years, over the centuries, different scholars have taken a stab at this, some people siding with, oh, yeah, it's, it's sort of somehow purusha, which is bound and liberated, but that doesn't quite work. Oh, uh, no, and then other scholars say, no, 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 it's actually prakriti, some aspect of prakriti. But that also doesn't quite work. And so other schools see this as the Achilles heel of the Sankhya system, or one of the Achilles heels of the, of the Sankhya yoga system. And I just want to leave it as an open question. When I was at Vivekananda University as a professor of philosophy, one of my PhD students, he wrote his entire dissertation on this topic, who is bound and liberated in Sankhya. And I have a friend uh, named Jeff Ashton at San Francisco State University who's going to publish a book soon on this very issue, who is bound and liberated in Sankhya. So it's a very live issue, and there's no definitive answer to it yet. So, uh, don't they propose some sort of mashup between Purusha and Prakriti, something? Sort of, some do. Hariharana Aranya sort of does. And he says that, you know who's bound and liberated? The jiva, meaning soul. What is a jiva? It's the union of Purusha and Prakriti. The problem with that is, Purusha and Prakriti are never united. By definition, according to Sankhya Yoga metaphysics, there's absolutely zero connection between Purusha and Prakriti. There cannot be. The Purusha is never connected in any way with Prakriti. And so even that, even though it's a, a very interesting creative solution, I don't think that quite works. But again, that's, this is my own take on things, and I want you all to think about it for yourself. Um, ultimately, I think that, in a way, Hariharanda would agree with me, 
And people who say that, I mean, this is a very interesting, your, the point you raise, that it is a kind of mishmash in a sense. But ultimately, what is liberation? The realization that there never was a mishmash. <laughs> and so it's this kind of weird, heady, sort of creepy, vaguely creepy f sense that, well, in liberation, in the state of liberation, you realize you never were, and that there was just purusha all along, and that there never was a bound soul. But interestingly, that comes perilously close, I think, to Advaita Vedanta. If any of you have studied Gaudapada's Mandukya Karika, there's a very famous karika which says, There is no universe, no creation, no dissolution, no sadhaka, no spiritual aspirant, nobody who's bound, nobody who's liberated. This is the ultimate truth. Advaitans can say this because they believe Brahma Satam Jagat Mithya. The only tr truth is non dual pure consciousness, Brahman. Everything else, an illusion. Never existed. Fine. Sankhya doesn't say that. Sankhya is a realist school. It believes in the reality of all the different Purushas, it believes in the reality of Prakriti. So, but it ends up, seems to be sort of moving in the direction of Advaita Vedanta on this issue. And ultimately having to say, well, actually, what you realize in liberation is that nobody, you were never bound, and nobody was ever bound. There's just purushas on the one side, and there's just prakriti on the other. And there was no suffering soul, nobody in bondage. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, I was going to get to the point of the fact that there is purusha and prakriti. It, it starts off with the foundation of reductionism, right? They're trying to make two exclusive entities. And they define the workings of mind as an illumination from pr Purusha, which is actually an interaction between Purusha and Prakriti. Interaction is tricky, but anyway, yeah. But so, yeah, I mean, mm, that might be too strong, but. OK, so thoughts come Illumination in, is nice. I like that right. word better, yeah. I mean, the illumination is kind of like. Activation a, is also pretty good. Purusha right. activates, yeah, in a sense. Yeah, because of that interaction, we can't really make a case of exclusivity, right? It has to be union, like Narayan mentioned. No, no, not, that's why I'm saying that we should be careful about the word, words we're using. Strictly speaking, interaction is probably too strong. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm interacting with the table by touching it. That's, that's much too strong a claim from the Sankhya Yoga standpoint. Purusha, in a sense, as Sakshi, as witness, illuminates the workings of nature, you can say. Right? But who is the one who feels, I am suffering, I am bound, I am reading the Yoga Sutras in order to try to attain liberation, asampragata samadhi? Who is that? Both together, right? That's the unity. I know, which isn't possible, according to Sankhya Yoga. <laughs> that, that's, that's what, the, the way they've defined it is making it challenging. Because of the way they've defined oh, these two as two different entities. Yeah, I know. That's what and then they have to somehow put them back together again, right. and it's very, very difficult. So at the end of the day, they can't really, because their metaphysics forbids it. It's a very, very interesting question, I think. Um, at the end of the day, it might be that the, 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 the bound soul never existed, and that's liberation. The jiva, the bound soul, is a kind of phantom entity that disappears, vanishes upon liberation. Isn't prakriti the maya? Prakriti represents maya is not a term used in Sankhya or yoga. Okay. We have to be careful. That's a very Vedantic term. But go ahead, if you want to no, follow up. Mm. Even though you're saying uh, Purusha is, is never bound, mm -hmm. it's always free. But we still have to use a Purushakar to know that we are, we, we are free. Yeah, yeah, no, that's yeah, So I, we use right. that yeah. to, you know, and, and then. Purushakar means self effort. And the Purushakar, yeah. Purush, Purusha and, uh, and, and Prakriti, even though they're separate, mm -hmm. but you still have to use your Purushakar to understand what is, uh, understand or, or, or to decipher in the, yeah. uh, what do you call? And to engage in prakriti, spiritual practice, yeah. Even though it's yeah. they're separate, to become free. Yeah. Otherwise, okay, you no. know, it'll be vegetables. Yeah. We won't you. be yeah. acting on anything. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, but let's be careful about terms here. I use the term purushakara, which means self-effort. Uh, there's only a superficial resemblance between purusha and purushakara. It's not, that purusha, the purusha and purushakara is not referring to Sankhya's purusha. It just means self, in, like, in the sense of self-effort. Kara means effort, and purusha there just means self, so self-effort. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. At the same time, though, the question, you kept using the word we. Who is that we? <laughs> who is the I who's reading the Yoga Sutra and trying to get liberation? That's the fundamental philosophical question. Um, OK. Uh, I want to get to a couple other things before we um, wrap up the class. That's why 
Let's move on. But I, this is one, I, one of these issues that's really fundamental, but, and just to keep it in the back of your mind. We might, we'll probably revisit it later. Oh, and the reason why I find Bryant's answer unsatisfying is as follows. Now let's look back again at, what was that, XLVI? Um, XLVI. Let's look at the sentence again. It is the mind that imagines itself to be the real self rather than a material entity external to consciousness. Look at the language. The mind imagines itself to be the real self. How can the mind imagine anything if it's not conscious? This is, at least this is my, uh, I, I don't see how that's, I, this is an in, in incoherent sentence. The mind is insentient. It's like talk, it's saying like a, a stone imagines itself to be conscious. How can a stone do that? A stone isn't the kind of thing that can imagine anything. The mind is just as insentient as a stone, according to Sankhya and Yoga. I know, exactly. Illuminated by, but that's all they say. They'll say that, that the mind is illuminated by Purusha, but it doesn't feel like it's a satisfying answer, at least to me. So that, that's the problem, is that he, he's forced to use these kinds of expressions to claim that the Prakritic mind is, is that entity that, that is bound and liberated, and yet those statements don't really make sense to me. They don't strike me as coherent. Because a mind is strictly insentient, can't imagine anything. It can't mistake itself to be the, bo uh, the body rather than Purusha. Is that statement presupposing the action, the illumination of Purusha that is happening? Yeah, I think it, I think it probably is. So uh, in that case, like, is he suggesting that Purusha illuminating mind and mind's function being to feel the bondage and the suffering, like it's... I know, but who's doing the feeling? There needs to be an I there, feeling. You can't say it's Purusha, because a Purusha is strictly separate from nature and never bound. And yet it can't be mind, because a mind has no eye sense, because it's not conscious. It's like saying, you know, now we have movies like, X, X, what is it, Ex Machina and all that, uh, about these, these androids that look exactly like a human being. But the one difference is they're not conscious, right? Or at least we presume that they're not conscious. It's, it's, these things get very, very tricky. But, so the mind is not conscious at all. And so I don't, I don't think it makes sense to say that the mind imagines itself to be you know, bound or whatever. OK, anyway, we do need to move on. Uh, but thank you. This is a very, very important issue. Uh, the 24 cosmic principles. Any follower, any devotee of our tradition, Sri Ramakrishna, will know that this is one of the terms used by Sri Ramakrishna in many places in the gospel. He says in many places, the Vigyani sees, realizes, that Brahman has become the 24 cosmic principles. Chotur Bhingshri Tatto. He's taken that from Sankhya. Page 50, Roman numeral 50, that chart, it looks intimidating. It sort of is intimidating, but it, the basic idea is actually fairly simple. This goes back to Kiran's uh, query slash uh, the issue raised by her. What exactly is Prakriti? Okay, let's look at this diagram, okay? Of the 25 tattvas, you're like, wait a minute, Sri Ramakrishna says 24, why does it say 25? Because it's including Purusha as the first tattva. Purusha on the one side, and there are multiple Purushas, okay? But that's taken as one fundamental entity. And then there are 24 tattvas of Prakriti, the 24 cosmic principles of Prakriti. Starting with unmanifest Prakriti, Avyakta, okay? This is the kind of causal matrix from which all the different things we see evolve. Our bodies, the pews, this uh, light, this laptop, everything evolves out of this fundamental causal matrix called unmanifest prakriti, okay? And then there's a sequence to this evolution. And so I'll just run, by, run through it very quickly. Unmanifest prakriti, from that evolves buddhi, otherwise known as mahat, and he explains what each of these things are, the first principle of individuation, intellect, will, and so on. From buddhi evolves ahankara, which is the eye sense, self-identity, ego. From ahankara evolves, the di well, different kinds of ahankara. And from the different kinds of ahankara, you get manas, the mind, the five uh, buddhindriyas, which means the senses of cognition, hearing, touching, seeing, tasting, smelling. The five karmendriyas, which is speaking, grasping, moving, excreting, procreating. The five tanmatras, this is another unique term used in Sankhya Yoga. It's translated here as subtle elements. It's very difficult to translate. These are not actually like physical in that, I mean, everything is physical, but it's a very, very subtle form of uh, physical matter. So it's like sound as such, shabda, touch as such, form as touch, taste as such, smell as such. 
but not in their gross forms. It's not actual smelling or touching. That's what makes it tanmatra, which is a subtle element. And then those subtle elements, the tanmatras, evolve into the five gross elements called the mahabhutas. That is space, wind, fire, water, and earth, from which you get all of this, right? Everything we see here is made of those five elements. So that, in a nutshell, is prakriti. Uh, and I think you have this sort of, Kiran, you, you, you have this kind of Vedantic intuition that, like, how can Prakriti just be there like that? Like, is, doesn't there need to be some kind of overarching unifying principle or source from which you get both Purusha and Prakriti? That is the fundamental Vedantic critique of Sankhya and Yoga. Swami Vivekananda, in his lectures on Sankhya and Yoga, makes exactly this point. He says, you need to postulate an Ishvara, a God, who is the source of both Purusha on the one hand and Prakriti on the other. And that's really, if you look at the Bhagavad Gita, it's a separate class I'm teaching, which some of you are in, that's really Krishna's view in the, in the Gita, seems to be. Because in chapter 15, Krishna says, Mame vamsho jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana. Each jiva, each eternal soul is actually an amsha of me. It's a portion of me. They come from me. In the form of para prakriti, supreme prakriti. And apara prakriti, the inferior prakriti, is this, all of this insentient nature you see around me, which also comes from God. So from God, on the one hand, each soul is a portion of the Godhead. And everything you see around you in insentient nature, also an aspect of Prakriti, uh, of God, sorry. Prakriti also. So lower and higher Prakriti, both aspects of God. You need a, uni a fundamental unifying principle in order to make this system coherent. And so, they, so Vedantins say that Sankhya Yoga is missing something fundamental in the form of the source, the ultimate source, Brahman of both Purusha and Prakriti. But they have their own arguments. Hariharana Aranya is a genius and has his ready answers to these Vedanta critiques, so I don't want to be dogmatic about it. But just think about it. Um, another thing. Even though yoga philosophy is based on Sankhya philosophy, there are some subtle differences. Swami Vivekananda already pointed out some of them in this book. Um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight is this. In Sankhya, there are three distinct terms in, on the Prakriti side. Buddhi, Ahankara, and Manas. Buddhi is intellect or will. Ahankara is eye sense, ego. And Manas is mind. In yoga, yoga doesn't refer to these three terms separately. It refers to just the term citta. And citta encompasses all three. So if we were to put it in, in the form of a mathematical formula, it's according to yoga philosophy, citta equals buddhi plus ahankara plus manas. Keep that in mind. Why? Because the word citta is used all over the place in the Yoga Sutra, starting with the very second sutra, which we'll talk about in the next class. Yoga citta vritti nirodaha. The whole aim of yoga is to restrain the modifications, the vrittis of the citta. So when we read citta in the Yoga Sutras, what it means is buddhi plus ahankara plus manas. Otherwise known, in Vedanta, that's actually called antakkarana. It's the whole package. Okay? The word manas, it's a little confusing because when we say mind, sometimes we define manas as mind. Sometimes we define antakarana as mind and chitta as mind. So let's keep in mind, ma, let's keep in mind, let's keep in mind that mind in the context of yoga encompasses all three, buddhi, ahankara, and manas. Not just manas. You follow? Okay. Okay, and very briefly I want to run through Ashtanga Yoga, the eight-limbed yoga. Yama, first limb, moral restraints, non-injury, truthfulness, non-stealing, celibacy, non-coveting. Niyama, ethical observances, cleanliness, contentment, austerity, study, devotion to God. And you'll find that these are kind of graded in a way. The, it's not necessarily that you have to practice them in strict sequence, but the earlier practices are more, they're certainly foundational to the later limbs, okay? Asana, here we get a very interesting point raised by Brian, because people love asanas, and that's like what yoga is all about here, in the West especially. Asana means postures, right? Postural yoga. So many different kinds of postures. But asana is defined in Yoga Sutra in a very, very austere way, it's, it, just, it just says, sit in a position which is comfortable to you and which allows you to sit still so that you can meditate for long periods of time. Brian adds something interesting, um, and I, I, 
I don't know which commentary is thinking of. He says that this third limb, asana, also includes all the kind of asanas we're familiar with, or at least many of them, downward dog and all these things. But what's the aim of all that? Not to look good or, or, or to live forever. No. But in order to be able to sit in meditation for a very long period of time. That's, that's Brian's take on this. I'm not even sure. I mean, I, I, maybe I just haven't read enough of the commentaries. I'm not sure where any of the traditional commentators gloss asana, the third limb here, in terms of downward dog, etc. I think it just means sitting in a comfortable, still posture for the purpose of meditation. But I could be wrong, and if any of you are aware of texts that uh, talk about asana in the more tradition, in, in the more the sense that we are aware of it these days, then vajrasana and all these things. Let me know. Um, but his main point, I, I think, is absolutely uh, vital, which is, and right, he says, it's a serious mistake to think that yoga means just doing these different kinds of postures. He says that's a huge mistake. Asana is just one out of the eight limbs, and you cannot just rip it out of its context. It has to be grounded in yama and niyama on the one hand, these ethical and spiritual practices, and it has to have the overarching aim, the telos, of realizing our true spiritual nature as purusha, separate from the body-mind complex. And he says any, any very sincere yoga practitioner uh, should accept that. OK. And finally, Bryant has this wonderful uh, final section in the introduction, uh, that section called The Present Translation and Commentary, kind of explaining why he's written a giant book, yet another book on Yoga Sutra, because there are already hundreds, if not thousands. But I think he's really doing something unique. And he's humble about it, but it's, it's uh, because there aren't, I, I'm not aware of another text that's quite like it, that combines uh, reverential uh, appeals to traditional commentaries and a strong emphasis on spiritual practice while also be, trying to be very scholarly and trying to remain rigorous. Um, and on page LX, so page 60 of the introduction, he explains what his audience is. It's important. You might wonder, am I, do I belong in, in here or not? He says, uh, he says, this is sort of about two-thirds of the way down. He says, I'm going to read from the middle of the sentence. He says, here's my audience, scholars and students of ancient Indian thought. So academics, that's the first thing, and students. But then he says, both within academia and without, seeking a synopsis of the text and its commentaries but also the educated but non-specialized lay readership, non-academics, but who are not dumb and who are educated. And then he says, and aspiring yogis, approaching the text as an historical source of authority for meditative practice and willing to marshal some intellectual rigor in this quest. So he's, very, he's being very ambitious, and I applaud him for his ambition. Whether he succeeds or fails is up to each reader. It's a very, very difficult project to pull off. I can say that from experience because it's, um, I, I want to attempt this kind of thing with respect to the Bhagavad Gita eventually, but Lord knows whether I'll ever write it or if I'll succeed, even if I do write it, whether it'll be any good. Because it's very, very difficult to write for multiple audiences, to be rigorous enough for academics while also being sadhana-oriented enough for the pure, hardcore yogis and spiritual aspirants while also being intelligible to non-academic educated lay readers, very, very difficult task. Try it and you'll see why. But he's trying it. And so I respect him for it. And I think that there's a lot to learn from this text, even when you disagree. Like I, I, I disagree with, I think his answer to the question of who is bound and liberated is too facile. And he doesn't raise the, I think, very complicated and difficult philosophical questions posed by saying that, yeah, it's just the mind that's bound and liberated. I don't think it's that easy. I don't think the mind can imagine itself to be bound or do anything because it's insentient and so on and so forth. I'm sure I'll disagree with him in other places too. And I'm, I'm in touch with him by email and he's a very nice person, so I don't think he'll mind like any true scholar. All right, so any questions? Just few additions, few lines. Uh, what do you say? Uh, Swami Vivekananda has uh, already explained that uh, on individual level or universe level. Mm -hmm. Everything is cyclical. Mm -hmm. Everything is first evolving and then dissolving. So we take an example of a banyan tree. Mm -hmm. The whole tree was in a small seed. Mm -hmm. And then in a favorable situation, it expressed itself mm -hmm. and again dis dissolved to a seed. Yeah. 
So if the seed becomes sterile, no more banyan tree again. Yeah. So same thing as on individual level. Yeah. We are gathering some uh, samskaras or attitude yeah. with our every life action, and that becomes a seed for next birth. So what we uh, are practicing yeah. to get uh, out of the, those uh, attitudes or samskaras, that is the practicing of yoga. And uh, that is uh, how to get our seed sterile. That yeah. is the Patanjali yoga. No, no, it's fine. I don't disagree with anything you're saying. Yeah. I don't think yeah. that it necessarily answers the question, yes. the million dollar question about who is bound and liberated. Yeah. But thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, and uh, let's see here. Let me look at some questions here. Himaja is saying, mind being bound makes effect sense. I think there's a typo here. Makes effect sense. Misidentification, which is realm of Prakriti, so it is the one that is bound. Sense. Makes perfect sense, maybe, is what she means. Mind being bound makes perfect sense. Misidentification, which is the realm of Prakriti, so it is the one that is bound. And then she says, I suffer is a thought in the mind illumined by Purusha per my understanding. So she finds Brian's explanation plausible, that mind is the one who's bound. And she's saying it makes perfect sense because misidentification is in the realm of Prakriti. But I guess here I'm saying that to misidentify or to identify requires consciousness. That's why Brian's using language of the mind imagining itself to be such and such. I don't think that's coherent. So that, but Hima Jha, you can follow up if you are not satisfied. Uh, Eric asks, is it the ahankara that is liberated? Uh, same problem as mind, unfortunately. Equally insentient. <laughs> so how can a stone be the one that's bound or liberated? So that, that's the same problem. Ahankara is as insentient as the mind. Uh, Vedantan asks, Maharaj Pranam, I is ego, isn't it? Ego seeks liberation from suffering through, through yoga. When it is liberated, the ego is dissolved. Yeah, I think you're moving in the direction of what I think is the only answer in a way, is that it is, call it ego, call it jivatma, or whatever. That's Hariharanala's term. But at the end of the day, the jiva doesn't exist. It's a figment. It's what I'm calling a phantom entity. And liberation consists in realizing that the jiva is a phantom entity, that nobody was ever bound or liberated. That's actually what the Sankhya Karika says. There's nobody bound or liberated. It's a very radical claim, actually. OK? Um, Marcella is asking, how does enlightenment show others in Sankhya? It can never be the vast, can it? If there are many purushas, then it is not limitless. Um, uh, yeah, the vast here, she's putting that in quotes. I think she's thinking of Bhuma from the Chandogya Upanishad. Yo vai Bhuma tatsukam. Uh, Meaning like the infinite, referring to Brahman. Uh, it can never be the vast. Yeah, I mean, if there are many Purushas, then it's not limitless. There's another critique from the Vedantic standpoint of Sankhya and Yoga. Swami Vivekananda is one of them who makes this. Oh, it's funny. When I visited Kapil Mat, this Haridananda ashrama, ashrama in, in Jharkhand, the, the Sankhya Yoga sannyasi there, uh, Bhaskarananda Aranya, he's still living. He's there. He's quite old, but he's still living. Um, because I, I'm a monk of the order, he's very happy, and he respects the Ramakrishna mission. And he says, I read the gospel every day for, he said, some 20 or 30 years. I love Sri Ramakrishna. Everything he says perfectly matches with Sankhya and Yoga. Swami Vivekananda? No. There, he says, Swami Vivekananda, he sometimes criticizes Sankhya Yoga. There, I don't agree. <laughs> but it's very interesting. He says, Sri Ramakrishna, I don't have any dis disagreements with, but with Swamiji, because he's trying to refute Sankhya, I have to disagree with him on this point. Um, OK, that doesn't answer your question. But anyway, yeah, I mean, these are serious questions. Um, and I think that's another line of critique that you can uh, develop from a Vedantic standpoint, that the purusha, you can't have multiple purushas because then you don't have infinitude. To have the true infinite, there should just be one non-dual self at the end of the day. Um, and so you have to push Sankhya and yoga in a more Vedantic non-dual direction. But anyway, uh, as I said, I try to avoid being dogmatic, and so I want to leave it up to you to think about. Uh, Rajendra is asking, how would you prove that mind is insentient? Uh, that's interesting. But I think that this is the kind of thing that neuroscientists are trying to do now, right? And they're trying to show that all the different functions of, of the mind, as we know it, thought and feeling, all these things, are actually just different functionings of the brain. Um, and they're, they're using sophisticated instruments and technology to try to prove that. Uh, ooh, Lin Kid is being saucy. Who is it that is giving this class? I don't know. Okay. Uh, uh, 
Himaja is just saying, I agree with Brian about postural yoga as a preparatory practice for keeping the body healthy and attaining good posture for meditation. So I'm glad she agrees with that. Okay. Uh, right. And then Sharad Pandya says, mind is prakriti or matter, but with the light of purusha, it takes the identity of a jiva. This is my response to your question of how can mind being in sentient... And then the last word is... a a wild typo, so I, it doesn't make sense to me, but, um, but I get what he's saying. So he's trying to defend, I think he's trying to make sense of Brian's explanation of the mind being who, the person who is bound. So uh, mind is practically a matter, but with the light of Purusha, it takes the identity of a jiva. Yeah, and this is along the lines of, I think you were saying about illumination and, um, yeah, I think that's the, that's the official Sankhya Yoga answer. It's that it's the mind illuminated by Purusha, which is bound and liberated, or at least feels bound and liberated. Uh, but still, if you, if you probe that a little bit more deeply, I think the next question is, but what exactly is that I that feels bound and that feels suffering? What is that I? What does it mean that it's the mind illuminated by Purusha? The, the I sense, on, the, the real I, the conscious I, only, can only exist on the side of Purusha because Purusha alone is conscious. And so it makes no sense to say that the mind then feels that it's suffering or bound, as far as I can tell. Even if you bring in the language of illuminated by Purusha, I don't think it solves the problem. I think it's just a kind of, I think it's verbiage. Anyway, but maybe I'm, uh, I'm missing something. Right? What? Then it's not Yeah, Purusha can't be the one that's making any mistakes because it never makes mistakes and it doesn't misidentify with anything. Mind can't misidentify because it's not conscious, for goodness sakes. <laughs> and, and then there's nothing left because there are only two entities, Purusha and Prakriti. Sorry? I said, and if anything, it then discovers that it is what it thinks it is. Like, it's not misidentifying as... Yeah, it yeah. And, and then you might say, well, fine, then there is no jiva at the end of the day. There's nobody bound. There's just Purusha. But then, it's, then, the, then the whole thing is a kind of a charade, a needless charade. Because this ne none of this ever happened. There was never anybody bound or reincarnating or suffering. They're just Purusha all along, and there's this nature doing its nature thing. I don't know. I find it puzzling. <laughs> but you guys can figure it out. Thank you. So as I said, uh, I don't know what the date of the next class is. This is the fun of being in Hollywood, is you never know what, what's coming in the next few weeks. This, our April bulletin is not set yet. But once it is... Uh, we'll have the next class, and it'll be on, remember, read Brian's commentary on Sutras 1 and 2 of Book 1 of Yoga Sutra. And try to memorize the first two sutras. It's very easy in the beginning. It'll get harder as you have to memorize more, but this should be relatively easy to memorize. All right, thanks, guys. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Sri Ramakrishna Arpanamastu